Hi everyone, I'm Jared. Uh, also work for uh, Cisco Talos Group here. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Maybe we won't. There we go. Um, so just kind of a quick overview who we are, what we do. Um, I tend to uh, fall myself in the detection research and uh, vulnerability groups up there. Um, really just getting to kind of play with stuff, uh, you know, figure out how devices work, find out how to break them, uh, and then try to find ways to help people, you know, protect against those things that we find and the things that other people find. Lots of fun stuff. Um, so the stuff we're going to talk about today uh, really stems from two uh, major places. Uh, the picture on the left there is a kegerator that uh, one of my teammates built, uh, actually most of the team before I got there, uh, built using strictly ICS SCADA network equipment, um, you know, except for the, the obvious kegerator stuff. Um, with the intention of both for, you know, the entertainment value, but also um, giving something for uh, people to hack to go play with and uh, get to play with some industrial protocols. So from that, uh, I had some of the devices, uh, some of the equipment inside of it is one of the ones that, uh, well, the main one we're going to look at here today. Um, which then also stemmed into uh, one of my teammates, Patrick, uh, a talk he did at DEF CON uh, this year ago now. Um, talking about a couple of the things that uh, I'll touch on here at the very, very end, um, that we, you know, took a few steps further and uh, made a lot cooler. So, um, I'm obviously not the first person to work on this as a uh, I mentioned just a few minutes ago, but then there's also been a whole bunch of people outside of Talos who worked on it, did a, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, so, you know, props to them that gave me some, uh, some stuff to look at, read, and go off of. So, uh, this project here, uh, we mainly had three main goals that we were looking at um, and that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, figuring out a way to remotely control um, a particular device, a programmable logic controller, uh, to then take once we have full control to modify the configuration that uh, is on that device to gain additional access that we are not supposed to have or that was uh, configured to not let us have and then take it even further and flash that device with firmware that we took from, you know, a default state, modified a little bit in the back end um, to kind of achieve what we wanted. Uh, so to start out, I, you know, playing with the ICS village and all that, I figure there's a few people in here who are familiar with uh, a PLC before, but can I just show hands? Is anybody kind of familiar with what they are? Oh, all right, Hell, a lot more than I thought it would. Cool. Um, so then as a chunk of you know, it's really at the end of the day just a computer. You know, it's got a different casing, it's a bit more hardened for, uh, you know, harsher conditions and all that. But um, at the end of the day it's just a computer. It takes inputs, so whether those inputs are switches, buttons, what have you, and, uh, you know, does whatever logic you program inside of it and gives you outputs. So lights, mixers, anything you want. Um, in particular, uh, the one we're going to focus on today, uh, the device I'm sure you've seen me fumbling around with up here, uh, is the, the one up on the screen, the Mycologics 1400, uh, made by Alan Bradley, Rockwell Automation, uh, same group. Um, that's kind of, it's, it's an interesting one uh, and it's kind of helpful for uh, demos like this and us to play with because it's a whole lot more compact than most uh, PLCs. Yeah. Everything is all in one container, I suppose is a better way to put that. We don't need extra modules for our inputs. We don't need extra modules for the outputs. Uh, we have the nice little uh, screen on there which, you know, can change some configurations from there. Uh, it's going to be really helpful for the demo later because I don't need to pull up all kinds of fancy uh, programming softwares. We can just show it straight on the device. Um, from Alan Bradley, the, the types of uses that it's there, it's, it's mainly in smaller environments, hence the, uh, the name Micro. Um, so just to get a couple base things out of the way so that whenever I'm talking through this, uh, anybody who's not familiar with this whole world, um, devices, PLCs tend to have uh, something called key switch states, or at least what I'm calling key switch states. Um, it's essentially just different modes of access that are often uh, changed through uh, physical controls on the device. Sometimes, and normally at least in the ones I've seen, it's a physical key that you go and you turn it from run, remote, program, whatever you want. In this particular device's case, there's no physical key, it's just uh, a menu and then you switch the states across the, uh, the three you can see up there. Um, program is kind of, you know, what you think. It's a programming state, you have a whole lot more control over, uh, you know, what gets configured on the device, all that fun stuff, but nothing is running while it's going on. Um, so, you know, if you have it such that uh, 
you flick a switch and a light comes on, that's not happening in program state. Uh, then on the other side there you have run state, which, you know, again, pretty obvious. Um, if you flick your switch, the light does come on there. However, you don't have, um, or at least you're not supposed to have control over programming a lot of the stuff. So that's where we meld into the remote mode in the middle, um, which is the uh, the fun, more interesting one, because it gives access to the outside world and it also gives a tiny bit, you know, some other uh, substates that you can play with and uh, see. And uh, it's largely what we're going to focus on for this um, attack, just because of some uh, requirements across it. But we got some fun stuff with run too. Um, in this device's case, uh, the communication protocol used is Ethernet IP and then within that a uh, application layer uh, command structure called PCCC. Um, for those of you not familiar with it before, it stands for the stuff up there. Um, it's a fairly simple in of itself, um, just you know a little structure of command transaction value, a function code and then um, data. So this here is just the simple case, um, we're going to expand later for individual commands. Um, but largely the, the blue ones stay the same, data changes based on, you know, if you're trying to do a read, if you're trying to do a write, what have you. Um, so looking through this, if anybody else is uh, digging into this stuff in the uh, coming future, these three uh, documents there, uh, one of them from the, the manufacturer, but the other two seem to be just uh, specifications for the protocol, really useful. So with all that out of the way, um, this is the base device configuration that we're going to start on um, to go through our attack here. Taking the devi device in front of me, the uh, 1400 series B, um, with the default SNMP state disabled, that's important. Um, that's one of the big things we're going to focus on here uh, as a demo, I suppose. And a firmware version of 21.003 or below. Um, at the time we were working on this, 2103 was, uh, you know, the most up to date and they've patched since and, you know, fixed a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about here. Um, you know, making it better as long as people are updating. Um, and then the two states I'll call less default um, is the memory module. Um, it's required to have a memory module. It doesn't come by default, so, you know. Um, it also needs to be installed without a special write protect feature, uh, which is normal if you just plug it in. Um, and the CPU state, as I mentioned before, in remote. So, let's get into it. Um, just to start, uh, first thing we're going to look at is enabling SNMP. Um, it's really important because we're looking to flash a device with new firmware. The way this device works for uh, flashing is leverages SNMP, so we can't actually get into the uh, flashing state without it. So with that, it's disabled by default, um, but it does not have a key switch requirement in this case. Um, it does if you're trying to do this through RS Logics, the uh, you know normal programming software for the device, but it doesn't uh, for the the way we figured out how to do it, um, and then the the things I mentioned before. So whenever uh, you know whenever we first look at this, trying to figure out how uh, the service gets enabled and all that, um, figured the easiest, best, smartest uh, move would be to go look at the normal programming software. So. Arts logics, if you heard me talk about it. Uh, the picture you see up there on the left is uh, what I'll be talking about as a uh, channel configuration uh, menu in this case, file later. Um, if you see in the top left corner, uh, you'll have an SNMP server enabled button or checkbox, what have you. Whenever that box is checked uh, is when you're, you know, starting to get SNMP enabled. However, there's that little caveat down, uh, what, three quarters of the way down, uh, that says power cycle is required before this can happen, which this is also reflected uh, over on uh, the picture of the uh, LCD screen at the very bottom showing that power cycle is required. So we can enable it, but in order for it to actually occur and, you know, let us use SNMP, device has to be power cycled. So uh, digging through, you know, Wireshark, it was at first uh, a pretty big pain. Um, so then we started looking, you know, what can we make it to do better? Um, wrote a Wireshark dissector for it, which is out there in the public now and can be used and makes life a whole lot easier to look at this kind of stuff. So uh, like for example, the, uh, the highlighted portion I have there is for the channel configuration file, what we were just talking about. Uh, and we were able to use this to dig deeper into the data and, uh, figure out further which, which bytes are important, which bytes are changing, um, and dive into it. But before we could actually do any of that, we had to find out what that data was. So this is where, um, if you remember earlier, I was talking about the, the base PCCC command. Uh, you take that 
and expand it out um, into the, the breakout shown above. Um, in this case, all the orange is the data. And we need to send two read commands in this case, uh, one to grab the first OX50 bytes and another one to grab the second OX50 bytes with that restriction just seeming to be a uh, limitation of the device, of the protocol, uh, something to deal with, but it wasn't very difficult as uh, the sub-element number field exists for you to kind of make some changes there. So when we build all those commands up, uh, we can send it back across in Wireshark, again watching, um, you know, what's going on using the dissector to watch a little bit better. Um, and you can see all of the, uh, the highlighted portions there is everything that came out of uh, this command. So all of the, I'm sorry, all of that data is all the data that comes back once you get that or once you send those commands. So this is the actual data contained within the channel configuration file. And the one we really want to focus on is the one on the, the right, the orange colored one there, which will break out into a little bit easier to see. Um, this is the same view as before uh, of the right hand side, except uh, on the very, very top we have just the straight data, um, the same thing that was shown, highlighted uh, in the screen before, uh, with that extra byte uh, highlighted a different color. This I'm gonna be calling the uh, protocol control byte really just because uh, it's a bit field that just contains, you know, individual bits as service on and off state for each of uh, the different services. As you can see the, uh, in the very bottom graph, those are the ones we were able to figure out. Um, didn't really dig a whole ton more into the, the question mark ones just because we were very explicitly looking at SNMP. Um, so we set that bit, uh, you know, combine it back up into a full byte and replace the byte uh, highlighted in the original response and in theory we should have SNMP enabled once we send it back up to, uh, back up to the device. But we ran into a bit of uh, an error. We kept getting uh, error responses every time we would send it and weren't entirely sure why. Uh, you know, at first figuring maybe we were just screwing something up but uh, you know, looking back and forth between different iterations of uh, the actual programming software to do it, uh, the data itself was staying the same as long as we didn't manually change it, uh, you know, in that uh, earlier menu. So it didn't really make sense. Uh, we kept digging further and found a couple bytes in particular that um, created issues, or rather that changed on a uh, not as predictable basis. Um, so now we have the uh, first response, so the first half of uh, the data we're worried about in the top back graph and uh, the second half in the bottom. This data is, I mean, we want to look at it as one big unit the whole way up until uh, the dark gray portions. Uh, so we found out that the, uh, the second set of orange is actually a CRC calculation performed across um, everything from uh, top left corner of the top graph the whole way just up until uh, the CRC bytes. So once we figured out that, calculate our CRC 16, across um, all of the new data and replace the old CRC bytes, we go ahead and use a uh, similar command to the one we were talking about earlier to uh, send it back up to the device and hope that it works. Which you can see here again in a, another Wireshark breakout. Um, in this case, you know, same thing we were just talking about here just in a, a prettier view. So once we do that, um, you can check on the PLC, you could check, uh, you know, in the programming software if you have it, uh, anything, you could even look, uh, you know, it gives you a successful response code, you can look there. Uh, you'll find out and uh, you should have the device in a state where SNMP is essentially queued to be enabled. Um, not fully enabled like we talked about earlier, needs that, uh, needs the power cycle. So next up was uh, digging into a way to find, or digging into uh, finding a way to reboot the PLC in some capacity, which turned out to be a bit more of an issue as there was, there was no default way to do that, um, at least not accessible in, uh, through normal activity. So again, the um, reason we have to reboot is so we can enable SNMP and there's no way to do it by default. Uh, again here there's no uh, key switch requirement for us, so uh, this just standing on its own could be run in run mode, but you know, for the full exploit we need uh, everything. So. Since we didn't really have any other, uh, you know, standard ways, we just kind of thought we'd take a super simple fuzzing approach and just see if we could get it to crash. Um, since all we really need the device to do is reboot, uh, if we could do that and somehow let that work, it would be great. Um, 
didn't really have a whole ton of hope for that to work, honestly, uh, because we were just piping random data into it, and uh, lo and behold, it eventually just kind of crashed, which was really cool. But it was a little difficult to reproduce at first because we were just piping a completely random stream of data in, and sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't, um, and sometimes it would take two minutes, sometimes it would take an hour. Well, one of these times we finally got a, uh, a good PCAP of it that, you know, one of the times it took just a couple seconds, and it could finally narrow down the data to um, what you see here being the important stuff. Uh, it's 24 bytes, all the nulls in this case uh, really don't matter. Uh, it's specifically the E8FF that when you send this and it's just TCP data, this isn't contained in any kind of, uh, you know, special protocol. Um, you send this to the device and it crashes. Kept digging that a little bit for more and uh, found the uh, fun situation where it didn't even need to be just those 24 bytes. If you sent any amount of groups of 24 bytes, so that's what the blue and yellow signify up there. Uh, as long as you send any amount of 24 bytes before it, all nulls, it will still crash, which was kind of cool. Um, and you know, interesting, certainly made us happy since that's what we were going for. And it left us with a bit of a problem though um, because so here you can see our SNMP queued like we were talking about. Um, we send our crash and then uh, on the far right you'll see that SNMP is now disabled again which isn't good. We kind of took a step back now and it cleared our configuration uh, whenever the crash occurred. So we need to find out kind of what was happening here, uh, dug a little bit more into uh, the spec sheets for what it is, and uh, found out it was causing this, uh, what, error code 2 uh, unexpected crash, or unexpected reboot um, error. And whenever this error you know, is encountered or gets triggered, what have you, it uh, goes and loads the something called the default program. So we didn't really know what this was at first. Um, it was pretty clear that it, you know, completely overwrote all of the ladder logic that you had, all of the configuration settings, uh, largely everything, and uh, left you in a state where you, you know, you'd essentially have to reflash the program, uh, re-download the, upload the program uh, to the device and go from there. So we couldn't really find any way to mess with the default program itself, largely because we didn't, we didn't really know where it was, um, but we found a more interesting option in leveraging a memory module. Um, so within the uh, configuration of this device, it was possible to uh, set a memory module and download your program to that memory module, and then whenever a crash or an error, anything that happened that would normally load the default program occurs, you can now have the memory module pull from there. So, gave us a bit more interesting of a way because we could control that now. You know, as we, we saw earlier, we're able to write and make changes to, uh, to the program. Now we can store them somewhere uh, and store them somewhere that's uh, better for the crash. So bought a memory module, started digging into how they work, and uh, this is where uh, the remote uh, requirement comes in, uh, mainly because it requires that we go through something that uh, I'm gonna refer to here as a programming routine. It's really just a sequence of commands that need to be sent before and then also after um, any of your desired commands so that uh, you gain the appropriate privileges and everything uh, before continuing on and trying to run any commands. So. Uh, in order to set this bit and, you know, let us progress and uh, load from a memory module, we have to send a command similar to, uh, to the one that we were discussing earlier to write, uh, it's called information back up to uh, the channel configuration. So in this case, uh, we just change, they're not highlighted here, but the uh, file number and file type have been modified um, to reflect, you know, more appropriately the, uh, the files that we're working with here, in this case the status file. Um, and then also some configuration data um, to ensure that the correct bit is set. Uh, since we're overwriting and crashing everything, um, this example just, you know, destroys everything that would have been in uh, the particular byte that it's working with. But normally you can, you know, do some math and set the correct bit and all the, all the fun stuff for a real one. But then once you have that command all built up, if you were to just try and send it, it's going to fail because you need to run through uh, this programming routine here. 
Um, as you can see, the three commands in the beginning, um, essentially it's just putting into a program mode. This is where uh, remote really comes in because you can't send execute command list or uh, get edit resource successfully. You obviously could just send them, but uh, you need to be able to send them successfully and get um, edit access on the device before you could continue and send the commands you want and then apply everything at the very end and return the edit resource so that uh, you know, things don't get all out of whack. Whenever you do this, if everything's successful and uh, you know works just fine, uh, you can look at it in the uh, what's it called the the programming software uh, in the status file and check out this byte. Make sure this bit. Make sure it's set. Uh, if everything's good there, or you look at the uh, status responses, uh, can continue on and go ahead. But we can't crash it just yet because all we did was make configuration changes. Uh, to make sure the device will boot like that in the future, we still need to store it to the uh, memory module. So again, can send uh, the command up above here. Uh, this will take the entire online program and store it onto our memory module for use later on. So, um, just to kind of recap that a little qu quickly uh, before we move on to the firmware stuff, um, take a patch device, modify its channel configuration file enable the device itself to load from its memory module whenever an error occurs. Take all of that online program now and store it to the memory module, crash the device, and whenever it all comes back up, as long as everything worked, SNMP will be uh, you know, completely enabled uh, and fully functional. So, uh, with SNMP enabled, I wanted to move on um, to you know, the real reason we were even looking at the, at the protocol was to flash new firmware onto the device. So, um, to do this we, you know, essentially for time requirements for, uh, you know, really a means to an end here, it, we took and modified one of the existing um, firmware files at the time. So just, you know, snagged it from uh, the vendor's website, pulled it down and uh, this is uh, some slides and uh, work that uh, one of my teammates did uh, and pulled and took uh, what's the text for remote, changed that to hacked, which is what we're going to show you later, um, and then just had to make some offsets later. Uh, we were able to do this because the whole file, or at least the portion of the file we're working with here, just is operating under a normal checksum. Um, so as long as all of the bytes add up to uh, the correct end value, then it's, it's good. Um, so as long as we took uh, all the changes from remote, down to hacked and made those same changes. If you look at the very beginning of the yellow, uh, you'll see one, uh, yeah, one character has been changed going from I think a capital D to a lowercase p. Um, if you go to do the math on there, the changes all come to uh, zero. And whenever you then go to flash it, it works beautifully. So, uh, to flash it, we, uh, we leveraged a SNMP backdoor that had been found previously uh, by Patrick uh, and then not patched. Um, so this is still sitting in the, uh, in the devices. It's essentially a, uh, a replicate of uh, the private SNMP community string, but it can't be changed, uh, which is unfortunate. But um, it gives you the same access and you can use it to do different things. So while messing with uh, the firmware update cycle, we found uh, a way to reboot the device, which actually we found this one before the crash, so we were really excited at first until the you know, realization set in that uh, we kind of loop in a circle here where we need SNMP to cause this crash but need to, to cause the crash to enable SNMP. So obviously this one wouldn't work uh, for our particular case, um, but I wanted to bring it up here just because, you know, going forward, uh, if, the, if SNMP is already enabled on the device for whatever reason, and you want to enable one of the different other services that was in that, uh, in the uh, bit field that was shown you earlier, it can be done like this. You don't need to go through the crashing, you don't need to use the memory module, uh, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about there won't mean, need to be done if SNMP is already enabled due to this which is rather nice. But uh, once that, you know, is all set, SMP is all enabled, um, we can go ahead and start with the firmware flashing. So uh, you'll see three SNMP commands there, or at least SNMP set commands there. Uh, one to set the 
uh, TFTP server IP address, one to set the firmware file name, and uh, one just as the uh, this crash that we were just talking about here. It's not really a crash. It just causes a reboot on the device, uh, and that sets it up into um, the proper mode for uh, pulling its firmware file from the TFTP server IP address that you specified. So here uh, you'll see in the, the Wireshark printout there, uh, it just pulling down through TFTP all of the the file that we created down to the device where it can then, uh, you know, if passes all the checks and everything, go through a flashing process on the device and end up in a uh, kind of final state with our modifications displayed on the screen itself. So, it's fun. I want to see a demo. Cool. So this is um, that same PLC we've been talking about this whole time and just kind of shown across a crappy little web camera. But um, yeah, you can read the important part. So um, check this out and make sure that it is running the firmware version that we were using at the time, uh, so the most update to date, up to date one at the time, uh, 21.3 and ensuring that SNMP is disabled, uh, as you can see up there. Well, that looks nice. We can go ahead and go through all the steps we were talking about earlier to uh, try and enable SNMP. Or at least we could if I had connections. Yay. Try this again. There we go. Uh, so now it's going through all the steps we were talking about earlier in that uh, little flow chart to go ahead and uh, update that channel configuration file, to make all the updates, uh, store that program, or I'm sorry, enable it to be able to pull from memory whenever uh, we would crash the device, and then store that new program to memory. And once everything's set up there, come back in here and we see that SNMP is enabled, uh, the nice blinking thing up top, and we have uh, the power cycle button or display shown uh, in the bottom. So if I were to crash it right now, well, since we've gone through all the process, it will work. Um, had we not already stored it to the memory module, it wouldn't. So do this and you'll see the uh, PLC itself, uh, you saw the fault light start to flicker there, the device, you know, essentially falls over and comes back up. We're good. So, double check everything. Nope. Make sure everything worked. Yeah. So now we have SNMP enabled fully without you know any worries. We can actually interact with the device now, and we can. Now we can flash the PLC uh, with our custom firmware or, well, modified, I suppose. It's going to go through the same process, um, essentially here just waiting and uh, whenever you see the lights on the left start to change some more, uh, it'll start pulling uh, the file itself down from the TFTP server. That's what it's doing right now before it starts actually flashing the device, which makes it really nice on this screen. And then 
once it's done flashing, it's going to essentially set itself to a, a reboot reset mode. Uh, unfortunately, not one we could uh, leverage for any of this. Um, and then reset itself and come back up online. And if everything went well, display uh, a little message up in the top right corner. Woohoo! Hey, now I don't need to use this. Ignore that. All right. So, impact of all of this. Um, I know it kind of seems like it was just a you know display change here that we you know it seems like we could just go on in and change to, you know a text file or something to read a different value. So it, it, it's important to remember where this change was occurring. Um, you know, whenever we did this, it was a firmware level change. It wasn't just a slight modification. Um, so you can take that to the next step if you have the time and the money and the interest um, and, you know, to a point where you, know, you can make really whatever changes you want. So instead of a display change, you use the same idea to uh, you know throw a backdoor in there somewhere, or you take it even a step further, figure out how the checksum uh, you know worked. At a, at a better level and implement whatever you want in there. Um, as long as you can get the device to accept the firmware, the process exists here to implement it. And all of that kind of brought me back to uh, the quote you see up there, or at least the quote snippet, I suppose is a better word, um, from Reed Whiteman talking last year at S4 uh, about the whole Trisis situation. And I, I realize it's a different context, but the the idea behind it kind of was interesting to me that, you know, in this kind of case you can no longer trust the device anymore um, because of the potential for anybody to do whatever they want uh, once they have access at that level. Just a little unnerving. Um, so fixing it, you know, what can we do to kind of protect against this um, and, you know, move forward with our lives? Um, main thing is really network segmentation, um, you know, kind of as you would think, these types of devices often don't need to talk to Google. Uh, you know, they're, they're in environments that can be segmented and pulled off in ways that would make it a whole lot harder to get access to them. Um, kind of continuing on that line, making sure you're actively looking at what's going on um, and understanding, you know, what your network looks like, your standard network monitoring stuff. Um, also, even though, uh, you know, I mentioned a couple times in here that there are things that can be run in uh, the run key switch mode, it still is, you know, a good idea if possible to put it into that mode because you reduce the attack surface that much more. Uh, and then finally, make sure the firmware version is uh, at least at 2104, which is discussing all of her, not discussing, but uh, protecting against a lot of the things that we talked about here and especially all the things that were able to be done here in run mode. Um, such as these ones. Um, so the two in orange are uh, two of the ones that we discussed today. Um, the three in blue are just other, you know, uh, vulnerabilities we found through this project um, that didn't really you know, pertain to the, the story here. Um, but they were still able to be done in run mode, which has its obvious bad problem. Um, so this is where, uh, especially if you're going to put a memory module in there, uh, would be suggested to enable a feature called write protect. If you remember from earlier, I said we can't have that on for this. Uh, that feature essentially will take uh, your device, write whatever your program is to it, and then cut off write access, at least logical write access to it, um, from there forward. So whenever I would go to uh, run that store to uh, memory module command discussed earlier, it wouldn't function. Uh, it just wouldn't work at least ideally, as long as there's not an issue there. But, uh, and then additionally, if you're running uh, Snort or any of those products, um, we have Snort rules available that you can enable to uh, detect on and check out some of this stuff. So, um, if you have interest in, you know, more details, any of that through, uh, you know, the other volumes we found through here or um, maybe a paper version of this talk, any of that kind of stuff, uh, Go ahead, check out all the stuff up there. If you were looking at this uh, protocol, the Wireshark Dissector is uh, working its way through their uh, their process. It's uh, you can find it in the dev build at the moment, but um, eventually it'll make its way to stable. But 
Okay. Any questions? <laughs>